Hello and welcome back to Spy Hard's podcast. And I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're back with another Spy Master interview celebrating 2008's James Bond film, Quantum of Solace. Cam, who do we have for our listeners? Yes, we are talking to director of photography, Roberto Schaefer, who oversaw the visuals of Quantum of Solace. Yes, Quantum of Solace is a film that was definitely divisive for people, and some people weren't a big fan of its editing choices and some of the visuals. So I think speaking to Roberto is very important to get his side of what he was trying to achieve with the film. So I think without further ado, Cam, roll that interview. And here we are, folks, joining us this week, the director of photography of this week's film, Quantum of Solace, Mr. Roberto Schaefer. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, uh, absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Now, Roberto, our time is short today, I know, so I think what we're going to do is dive right into the action, just like Quantum of Solace does, Okay. okay? And let's get down to business and talking about the film. But I think to lead us in a little bit, let's just talk about Bond. Because obviously before this film came along, were you a fan of James Bond? Had you seen some of the films? What were your thoughts on it? Oh, yeah, I, would, I mean, I've been a fan of Bond since uh, my cousin took me under age at 13 to see uh, From Russia With Love in Kansas City uh, in the movie theater, of course. And um, I loved that. Of course, you know, the, the sexuality of it wasn't a bad thing to draw me into Bond and as, at the age of 13. But yeah, I mean, I loved um, I loved from Rush with Love, and then Doctor No and Goldfinger were you know three of my favorites all along. And I probably have seen, I think I saw every Bond film as it came out. Um, I maybe fell short a little bit during the Roger Moore years because they got a little too wonky for me, a little corny. But um, there was still always something that drew me in. I, I, I agree with you on the Roger Moyer. I was a late bloomer. I was uh, brought in by Piers Brosnan. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I, when I go back to those uh, Roger Moyer, I, I, I struggle to think how they survived for so long because they do go a bit crazy towards the end. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I'm a Roger Moore kid. So for me, that was my entry point. So <laughs> well, that's, that, that's how it usually is with mm-hmm. things. You know, it's um, music or art or anything. It's, it's what you're what you relate to in your nostalgia, what you grow up with, it can be either you can completely hate it because you had a bad childhood and times were terrible, or it was like, it just brings back that warmth and that feeling. And it's what you, you know, what you relate to. And, and that was, for me, it was uh, Sean Connery and, uh, and he was the man. Now you'd worked with Mark Forster um, on a number of films, you know, Monsters Ball, The Kite Runner. How did he approach you about Quantum of Solace? Um, he was walking down the street in New York city and I got a phone call from him here in LA and he said, so, um, listen, I just got a, uh, I just had an interview or a, a meeting with, um, Barbara Broccoli and Michael, um, Wilson. And they're asking me if I want to do the new bond film. And he says, what do you think? And I said, absolutely. He says, are you crazy? Yes. It's bond. Yes. I, I, I can't see how anyone would turn it down when you get that, uh, that offer. Some do, some do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then then what happened was I think he called Matt also, Matt Chesse, and Matt and I talked and we both said, come on. Yeah, we got it. How can you turn down? Bond? It's like our one of our childhood. It's kind of a childhood dream to get to do a Bond film, to shoot, you know, to work on it. And um, and then Mark called back again after having another meeting or, or something was going on. He goes, you know, I, I just don't know if we really should do this Um because the script is just not there. It's just not a, it's nothing fleshed out yet. We don't really have a script. Do you think we, do you really think we should do this? I said, Mark, it's going to be a Bond film. It's going to be history. Yes, we should do it. And he said, okay, okay. Let me see what they say. And uh, that was it. Then they called me in, they called Matt in, they called us all his collaborators in for an interview and we were on board. So when you're meeting with them, what sort of ideas are you presenting initially? before, you know, you kind of go through development a little further? Well, when I first met with Michael and Barbara, it was really just about, you know, face-to-face seeing that we could, that I didn't smell bad mm. and that I, you know, I actually was who I was supposed to be. Um, just getting to know each other as people. There was no real, you know, yes, I'd seen all the Bond films. Yes, I love Bond. Um, um, I, and, I, and I did say, I think at that point that Bourne was giving them a run for the money. 
and that there was, you know, it, the, the ante had been upped, um, but the Casino Royale was, you know, responding very well to that. And I thought we should just take it, you know, that one step farther. Um, and they, you know, they, they, you know, they trusted me. I mean, Mark and I had done seven films together before that, I think. Um, and Matt and we had done, I think Matt was on all of them too. Well, no, Matt was on five of them. Um, and then he brought in Dennis Gassner, um, who had not production designed with him before, but, uh, and, and Barbara and Michael just, you know, they, they embraced us. Well, you, you mentioned um, Mark bringing in sort of his team, as it were. Um, but one thing the the Eon productions have always had is sort of a similar cast of characters every year. Same sort of pool of directors. And then behind the scenes, you know, second unit, usually editing, kind of the same people. They change them out from time to time, but they really have a core bunch they tend to go back to. What was it like just bringing in this whole new crew of people? Were you, was it easy to assimilate into the production or were there some problems early on? Um, no, I don't. I don't recall any problems. I mean, Michael and Barbara, as I said, were really very welcoming, mm -hmm. and Greg also, um, Michael's son, very, very welcoming. Very, you know, as long as we were there for the right reasons and the things we wanted to do was to make a Bond film as good as it could possibly be, um, they were all, you know, they were all there with us. Uh, the art department. Um, I mean, Dennis. I'd never worked with Dennis before, nor had Mark, but Dennis was great. And his crew, some of them had worked on Bond before. I think they'd worked on Casino Royale. Um, they were all very, you know, it was, there was no, oh, you know, the new guys, uh, you know, stay in the other side of the, of the, of the court. Um, no, none of that. And they had, I don't know what happened in some of the upper echelons with some of their um, executive type of people, but, and I, I think they kept Terry Bamber on as an executive producer or producer. Uh, he did not direct maybe he did direct some of second unit i'm not sure i don't remember now um but some of the some of the old guard were kept on in different roles i think it's because they're family they really are family i mean even the caterers were the same caterers they had had for the last 20 years so it was you know kind of a, a weirdness there um i don't want to talk <laughs> about the caterers um, um but no and, and you know and Mark brought in Dan Bradley as the main second unit action guy because he had seen what Dan could do with cars, especially in Bourne and in uh, what was the one, the Nicolas Cage movie. Um, oh, Gone sorry. in 60 Seconds? No, no, it was, a, it was the one where he plays twins, I think. Um, oh, Adaptation? Adaptation, yeah. There's a very simple car crash in Adaptation, but it just comes out of nowhere and it gets you. And that was the kind of thing that Mark was looking for. The 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 unexpected, the immediate, the, the shock value, which Dan had done. Um, and Dan was, you know, Dan did some great stuff. And then they brought in, because Dan couldn't do all of it, they brought in Simon Crane, who had worked with them before. And Simon did the boat work uh, in uh, Panama. But I chose Josh Bleibtrau as the second unit DP to do that, because I had worked with Josh and I knew him very well. And he was a good friend. And I knew that he was one of the top second unit action guys in the world. Um, and uh, they let me bring him in. You know, they, they let us. In. The only thing we couldn't do was we had to use a British crew anytime we were in England. Most of the time when we were in South America, we brought the same crew with us. I was able to bring in a couple of camera assistants and Josh into Panama. Um, that was about it. And we couldn't shoot anything in the United States because of it was a non-union show and they didn't want the Hollywood post 60s to kick in. So the, we couldn't shoot on any United States property. They shot in Mexico. The, the, the dog fight was shot, outdoor one was shot in Mexico. And I had one of my operators, uh, old friend, Steadicam and regular operator was on that from LA. Dan Bradley did that. And the, a bunch of California people did that. But um, everything else was, it was a British crew pretty much all the way through. You mentioned the script not being finalized early on and the, the pre-production of this film in terms of the writer's strike is yeah. well documented this is not breaking new ground and it would you know what we're saying here for you as a director of photography did the lack of having maybe a, a particular vision early on sort of hinder what you were doing or did you were you able to do a normal job with it it was easy to take to this film no i i 
think I was able to just go with the flow because we had a 14 day, extremely um, well paced, I should say, early location scout throughout Italy and Switzerland and Austria, just traveling around before the script was really finalized. I mean, there was, to, for example, there was one scene that was noted. It said, whatever scene number it was, Bond and I forget Olga's character's name, Bond and so on. They jump on a motorcycle, they run, ride through the woods, chased by helicopters. They have the chase of their life. That was it. So you start to visualize things you can do with even just that, not knowing what the location is really going to be like. Not, and there was before drones, not knowing what we'd be able to really do. But we, we went around Italy and we saw a lot of these really cool locations and said, like we saw the Stelvio Pass, which has since been shot, but we couldn't shoot there because it was only open from snow guaranteed for one week in June. And we weren't shooting until July. Um, so, but we looked at it and we go, oh, this would be a cool place. How can we work out car chases and things? And then we adapted that to Carrera and to Le Garda, to the, the, the scene up there that, that opens up the, the movie. Um, and I worked hand in, you know, hand in hand with Dan and Sean O'Dell, who I also picked to be the second unit DP for Dan through interviews in, in, uh, in London. Um, and we went through the, the story and we went through the, the, the points in the way that I would have liked to have seen it. And I shot some stills with Dan of the Aston Martin to show him ways, angles that I thought would work really good for the car to accentuate it. And, um, and of course, then didn't try to let him, I didn't try to prevent him from doing his job of how to do the action stuff. But it was, it was, um, it was interesting. You know, again, there was a lot of scenes. It was tougher on Mark for sure. He was, you know, I don't know how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, plan out the the way this whole thing moves. If I don't know where the actors, what the scenes are going to be, what's going to happen with the actors and the story. And of course, you know, the actors, as you know, the, the writer's strike and, and the impending SAG strike, which was supposed to happen, I think June 1st of the next year. Um, the only thing that was really set in stone was the Palio sequence because Michael and Barbara had seen the Palio the year before and decided they wanted to do a, seen there and they reserved shooting spots a year before <laughs> and they have palios every year there's one in june and one in july so on on our first location scout trip we part of it was we stopped in siena and saw the june palio so we knew what it was gonna be like when we went back in july to shoot it so it was there we had you know more of a a real storyboarded kind of visualization of how to how to deal with that but we didn't do any storyboards on the show. They, Mark, um, uh, Michael and Barbara had a storyboard artist that they'd used on past movies. And they brought him in to work with us and Dan for the whole opening sequence. And we just looked at what the guy was doing. And Dan and I, we said, this is, this is, these shots, they're useless. It's, you know, we're better off just having a shot list because those are not the images that we would ever do. So he went home after a few days and, uh, and we just had shot lists and, and worked from, the way Mark and I have always worked with, with uh, shot plans and working it out and then adapting everything to on the day with the actors. And like this movie introduces like, a, as you referenced it earlier, like a very immediate visual style that had never been done really in the Bond movies. And I would just like to know, you know, was there any pushback initially about such a radical reinvention of the visual style? No, no. I mean, and we, we, um, parenthesized the visual style with Dennis to them as a retro 60s feel and look with modern adaptation and action, um, more updated. So it wasn't stilted because some of the early action stuff, you know, in the 60s, whatever, they just didn't have the wherewithal to do it. And we tried to do as much as we could real. Uh, Chris Corbold, our, our special effects supervisor, is incredible, does incredible work. Um, there was visual effects, obviously, but they were usually, most of them were enhancements, um, not complete constructions. Um, they they loved the idea of, you know, we re referred, we referenced really Goldfinger and Dr. No as our touch points, color palettes, uh, framing, kind of shots, structures, scene structures, and then bringing in the more modern uh, chase scenes and car chases and the boat stuff and stuff that we could do with tools that they didn't have in those days. And I'm curious, you know, you had a background doing the mockumentaries with Christopher Guest, for example. How much of that sort of documentary-like verite camera work 
works into a movie like this when you're creating action that has this sort of immediacy? Not much. Okay. Not much because also for safety reasons, you know, for you doing action scenes, even, I mean, I did quite a few of the action scenes that weren't the big car things uh, like the, the big fight uh, and the knifing scene in the hotel room near the beginning uh, the all the stuff in the hotel at the end with the chase and the dropping and the flames and all that stuff we did uh, ourselves that was in second unit um, but everything has to be to the millimeter precise and you know I'm sure you saw the stories there was a stuntman injured pretty seriously in Lake Garda for a accident for some piece of machinery that didn't engage or disengage the way it should have um, but yeah all that stuff we're so, 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 and even now more with, you know, what's happened in the last few years, really pay attention to safety on set that um, you really don't sort of get into the, uh, um, oh, let's just go off and just, you know, shoot that and, and drive the car into that wall there. Cause it looks cool. We can, and, and the, have the actor turn and talk to us while we're, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just, it just also doesn't, didn't really fit in this. I mean, occasionally I think, the actors are free to, you know, to do some lines that aren't scripted for sure. I mean, that's part of an actor bringing life to the character. But as far as setups and stuff and camera wise, it's pretty much, you know, we, we had a plan and we went with whatever worked for the, the locations and the, and the scenes. Now, one thing um, you, well, you mentioned the Bourne films. They were sort yeah. of, they were they were looming over the bond the bonds at this point. They they had you you had the first three by this stage, um, and of course the success of Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. Was there any sort of I don't want to say pressure necessarily, but was there some something sort of looming to have another hit on the level of Casino Royale to compete with what Bourne had done and to keep up with Casino Royale? Because in the past, Bond has had some big swings and you know home runs and then not so much home runs but um did you feel that pressure to keep the throttle like for casino royale yes um partly i believe that eon wanted to make sure that this film grossed more than the last one they want everyone to you know to keep going up so they keep their deal going with sony or or united artists or mgm whoever is at the time to continue so they're not going to say, oh, you know what, your last film kind of tanked and we're going to, you know, move on to something else. Because I don't know how long their deals are, you know, in advance, how many years or how many films they promised. But I know they had a deal with Daniel for for the five films or something. So uh, that was an ongoing thing. But, yeah, no, there was pressure and there was pressure on we gave it on ourselves. We didn't want to let the audience down and the fans down. And we wanted to we wanted to outdo it, um, which is part of the reason why. Mark very wisely, I think, said the first 15 minutes of the film, nobody's going to, nobody in the audience is going to, is going to get to breathe. We're going to start off with a smash in the face and it's just going to go. I want a 15 minute block of nonstop action. Just go, 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 where you can't even think. Partly because we didn't have a great script then and there was really no lead into it. But he says, so we've got to, we've got to take this with, grab them by the throat and throttle them. And, you know, so that's where it went from there. Um, and to be honest, I also said, I thought Casino Royale, except for the opening black and white establishing who the character was and the parkour sequence was a bit of a snorer up until you get into the uh, sinking building in Venice, which was kind of exciting. For me, the car chase where the car flips over was ridiculous because it was on an empty racetrack. <laughs> it did not look like it was on a real highway or there was anything around there. There was no buildings. There was nothing. The car flipping 17 times over was so unrealistic and just, it took me out of it. Excuse me, Phil, I don't want to, you know, step on your parade, but I had problems with it. Um, And I love Phil Mayhew and he's a great DP. Um, And then the other thing was how much time do you want to spend in a casino with Giancarlo Giannini explaining the card game to Vesper so the audience knows what's going on I mean, to me, that was like, really? Get over it. It's just so boring. It was out. It felt like hours. You know, I was falling asleep. It's like standing in a casino. If you're not playing cards and it's not one of your family there winning or losing, what fun is it watching somebody else play cards, especially if you don't even understand the game? So 
I didn't think Casino Royale was that big a deal to top. In the end, the audience spoke, and I guess they prefer Casino Royale. It, it um, it goes to show kind of to what you're saying there. One thing I've read in the past is you can tell that the action is quite slow in Casino Royale because after every hand of uh, poker, they have to do something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, the, it, but and then it always goes back to a hand in poker. It's just, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was odd. Well, you, you mentioned the, I, I was going to bring up shortly anyway, the, the start of the film. That chase sequence um, for me is one of the two highlights in terms of visuals in the film. Yeah. Um, I was looking at some of the behind the scenes stuff and, and they had that car with the, the crane camera chasing it and it's a wonderful chase scene and probably one of the better ones I've seen in James Bond of all the 25 mm -hmm. films maybe just take us a little bit more into what went into putting that scene together obviously you said it was more to do with because there wasn't a big script at the point so it was more just about to give him something you could create but you know was, yeah. putting that together yeah it was, it was I mean it was the idea was really to get from the end of Casino Royale, where Mr. White is at gunpoint, mm -hmm. getting him in the trunk and having Bond have this voyage, being chased by bad guys, by the cops, by everything, by the Carabinieri, um, to deliver Mr. White alive to the interrogation. So whatever craziness they could do to get him and believe that Mr. White was actually alive in the trunk, um, and conscious was just, you know, let's just make it as exciting as possible. And, and he said, Dan Bradley is really great at working with car chases. And he, he basically came up with that, you know, after location scouting, he came up with the, the trajectory of it, I should say. And that was really the whole thing was just to, to get you from A to B with a lot of action in between exciting, you know, crazy shit. And you mentioned how, you know, with that car chase, you want the audience to be basically on the edge of your seat. And launching them immediately into that chase without the gun barrel definitely has that effect because there's an expectation built in. And I know, like, people have quibbles about the lack of gun barrel. I would just like to know how quickly in the process did you decide, we're not going to do the barrel, we're going to leave it to the end because we want to catch people off guard? Well, it definitely marks that he didn't want to have it right at the beginning because mm -hmm. it does slow you down. He didn't want to have the big fancy entry, you know, like a credit sequence, which everybody loves the Bond credit sequences. I've loved most of them. There's a few of them that I thought were kind of tank also. Um, but he wanted just, like I said, smash them in the face. Don't give them time to think. Don't give them time to settle in their seats. They're getting there. They've got their popcorn, whatever. And suddenly it's just wham. And don't, and don't do it for three minutes, like a song. Do it for 15 minutes. So they're like really push back in their seats and like, my God, when is this going to end? When am I going to get to breathe again? And what is going on here? And that's why it was, you know, done in that way. And I, I thought that was very successful. Yeah, I know. I mean, it definitely had real impact. I remember seeing it in the theater and something else that, you know, I was noticed it at the time, but rewatching it even last night, the uh, color palette of this movie with, you know, the turquoises and blues and yellows and oranges, uh, Mark Forster has talked a lot about the four elements and the way they work mm -hmm. into the action sequences, but it works with the color palette as well. I'd really like to know just the development of that and how it kind of happened into the movie, how you guys decided on that. Well, I, I think a lot of it had to do with at the beginning when we said we wanted to start with the Dr. No Goldfinger feel, which was a lot of gold and black and, and those the warm, uh, the fire and air colors or uh, fire and earth. Um, and then we knew we had all this stuff going on in Haiti, the Caribbean, so and so. So we said, well, we should embrace the water and the blues and the turquoise of the blue, and that, and that's a complementary to the yellow and the the warm uh, golds and, and oranges. Um, so it just made a, a nice, uh, full rounded palette without being overly um, obvious in the sense of where you get a lot of films then and now still. You get to the bad guy or whatever, or the depressing place, and it's green fluorescence, green fluorescence. He said, no, we don't want to do the green fluorescence. It's just, it's just, a, it's a trope that's, we feel is going to bring us down. We wanted to keep it fresher feeling, more breathing, and have other elements of the action in the movie 
get you into what was danger and what was, you know, uh, where, where the fear was and all that. And that's where the fire and all of that came in with the, you know, using the natural elements. And one of the, I think, most genius things in terms of the visual design of the movie is using so much of the turquoise throughout, but also every time you shoot water in this movie, it looks unbelievable. I have rarely seen bodies of water look more beautiful than in Quantum of Solace, which of course, when you tie it all together with the villain plot, with the plan to steal water, it's almost cluing you in from moment one of the movie. So I think it's like a very rewarding reveal when you see the movie the first time, but then to go back and see the way that the visual design has sort of led into that. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. We we work really hard on giving uh, visual clues, and I worked really hard on making the film visually stunning as I could. Um, for me, camera movement, framing, and lighting are all equal partners. I never separate one from the other. So the framing is extremely important, and it 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 leads you to where it leads the audience to where you want to bring them to. Um, we couldn't shoot anamorphic because we didn't have enough time in post for the visual effects to deal with it. So we shot spherical, which was okay. We shot 35. I tried to get Michael and Barbara to go for 65 millimeter. Um, and I did a demo for them in Warner brothers in LA and showed them a film that had been shot that was supposed to show off the big difference between 65 and 35. And unfortunately it wasn't a great projection and it wasn't the best film to show them. And they said, eh, it's not worth two and a half million dollars just to shoot 65. I said, Fine. It's okay. Um, you know, I'm happy with 35. We shot with Master Primes, which are very clean, because to me, it felt like this should not be a, a vintagey feeling film. This should be feel you're there, you're in it, it's you're part of it, but not like digitally crisp. Although there was really no choice to go digital at that point. We were, we would have been the last Bond film to shoot on film because Roger then shot the next one on the Alexa. And of course, the next two guys decided to go back to film, which is, you know, fine. I'm happy with that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was all part of color design and what you could do with film, knowing that, you know, where your color saturation levels could be and doing a DI, which, so it's not, you're not restricted to the, you know, the, uh, the Hazeltine and just your three uh, cyan blue and, and magenta, um, but or cyan yellow and magenta, you, you at least had the full range to work with to finesse it all. And I had a great colorist, Stefan Nakamura, at company three really you know i really wanted to make sure it was all the colors were true to where we wanted to bring it and take the audience and i shoot almost everything with a polarizer filter and i think that that's really helps with skin tone and with water bringing all the 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 dimension to it so it's not just flat reflective surfaces it has a lot of dimension right i think you may have also set the record for how blue daniel craig's eyes could look in a movie yeah, I think that might have been a little bit of a cheat in the, uh, oh. in the deal. Um, but, you know, he's got blue eyes and he's a sweetheart. He's a lovely man. Mm. And I will give him as many blue eyes as he wants. <laughs> or deep blue eyes as he likes. Um, when you mentioned about Bourne, mm. I, one of the specific things I wanted to do was up the bar for Bourne. And mm. Dan Bowley had shot, had done the second unit on that Bourne movie um, where I don't remember which one it was, but I know the Moscow tunnel, the car chase, the taxi chase through the tunnel, but he also did, it was the, the one that had Matt Damon runs across the rooftops in Morocco and chasing the guy and the guy jumps through the window, Matt chases after him and the camera stops at the window. And I said, Dan, you fucked up. Sorry. You messed up, Dan. <laughs> The camera should have gone in through the window with him. It should have continued with him. That's where I lost. I just wanted to go with them. I needed to go with them. To me, that's where you draw the audience. You take them. I said, we had this whole scene then that we worked out in Siena with the going off the tower and going into the art gallery. And I said, the camera is not going to stop. It has to go through the art, through the glass, through the art gallery, come down and swing around with them and stay with them with Bond the entire time. So that was one of the things I said, I don't care what happens, that's got to happen. And we worked it out that way between visual effects, making the glass dome, which they put in, the cameras on descender rigs and uh, all this stuff that happened. It was all shot on stage. Um, it, you know, to me, that was, that was part of my um, wish list that had to be 
achieved. I would have felt there was a failure if we didn't get that. And that's where I thought also what he did with the car chase at the beginning. He took you that extra, you know, you were inside that space. Right. I'd never picked up that the uh, that moment in Quantum was like a, a, a receipt to uh, Jason Bourne in Bourne Ultimatum. But now I can, I can it's I, absolutely, it's an evolution of 100%. Yeah. It makes complete yeah. sense. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's not, it's not an obvious thing because it's not like he's jumping through a window following that we could have done the same thing in Siena have him go mm-hmm. through a window and follow. But this was, I mean, the art gallery thing was such a spectacular thing and to do the fall and all that, but it was just, and that's what, that's what triggered the response in me was seeing that in Bourne saying, I want to go that one step farther. Well, I, I, I kind of want to go back to digging into Bourne a little bit, but I have another question I want to take us on to. And that is, I learned today that this film, at least at the time, I can't, check with the other three films that came afterwards but this had the most amount of countries visited and shot in for any bond film you had six different countries you went to i thought it was seven wow well mm. wikipedia might be wrong that's even more let's go for seven uh, let's see. there was uk uh-huh mexico um um panama chile austria switzerland yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> I'm trying to check it against uh, IMDb. I, to be fair, you're the you're, you are the cinematographer. You know, so I'll take Wait, your number. Did it, we didn't we didn't shoot in Switzerland. Italy, Italy, and Austria. We did not shoot in Switzerland. We scouted Switzerland, but we didn't shoot there. Ah, there we go. We scouted Peru also. The scene where where they where they're in the cave, and then when they walk out of the cave. Uh, and they come out into that the desert area in the, the Atacama Desert where the people, mm-hmm. Bolivian peasants, are, you know, there's no water coming out of the tap there. Well, coming down the hill, that was going to be this open salt flat mine in the Peruvian uh, Andes, which I had, strangely enough, shot on a documentary uh, 10 years earlier for an Italian documentary. So it was a return to that place for me. And it was a beautiful place. Um, Dennis Gaster, the production designer, got sick on that trip to there because of the altitude. It was too, it was like at 15,000 feet, I think. So incredible place. But it got cut out of the plan because it was just one stop too many in the schedule. We couldn't have done for what it was for the one basic shot. It wasn't worth going there. And do you mention Switzerland as well? That, that didn't make it in? No, Switzerland didn't. We went there, we scouted to see what underwater. I mean, underground um, lakes would look like in reality. Right. And so we went to two of them in, or one or two in Switzerland, but they were very, they were much smaller in, in space that it wouldn't make sense. We would have had to expand it so much anyhow in post that it was just better to build it on stage and do it that way. Right. But we got the look, the, the true look and the reflective light mm-hmm. and all that from that one in Switzerland. You have that moment you mentioned of them walking out of the cave and then walking through the desert. Were you surprised when that shot wound up being used as the poster? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't had no idea they were going to use what they were going to use ever. I mean, we shot special poster images, which were used for the like the teaser poster, which didn't even say anything on it. I think it just was a picture of Bond. I shot a bunch of uh, footage of him coming over a, a crumbling hillside with the gun pointed down and you know shooting up at him uh and they use that for some pre posters bus bus stop things i think i have a bunch of them in my closet but it, that was never released as a as the film poster itself right and one sequence i really want to touch on which i think is maybe for me my favorite moment in the movie is the opera sequence and yeah. i would love to know the challenges of shooting that where you've got a massive crowd there's an opera going on and you're trying to kind of capture everything that's going on with everyone in the audience, what's going on on stage, and then Bond way up, you know, in the rafters looking out at everyone. Well, we had the benefit of on that first 14-day location scout trip, besides going to the Palio, they had decided they wanted, Barbara and Michael had decided the year before they wanted to shoot a Tosca, which was going to be going on for two years. So on the first trip, we went and we watched a performance of Tosca. Mm-hmm. And I got to sit with the lighting director and go through all of his board and all and go out there with a the light meter before the or after the event um, to see all his where, where everything was levels were at. And we discussed things and I had him do trims for us for the film. So it was basically the same lighting for Tosca, but the levels were adjusted that it would work better for what we were shooting on film. 
We also checked out all the different positions and places to go to shoot everything. Um, we had a full performance of Tosca for us at our, at our, uh, uh, I think two nights, I think we got to shoot the performance and we shot one night, maybe it was one night, the performance and two nights, everything around it, but we didn't shoot with a full audience. We had, I think a, th a third of the audience or a quarter of the audience. And we moved them around depending on where we were shooting. And then they were replicated in some of the bigger wide shots. Um, but it was, it was exciting because it was a, you know, it was a real, the way they really did Tosca the way they really did that performance. And we got to see it the year before to understand. And I could plan it with stills and everything and figure out with Mark how we wanted to approach it. And there's, you know, in the escape sequence there, there's a lot of cross-cutting between the opera and the action. And there's cross-cutting earlier with the, you know, the horse race and yeah. the action there. I'm curious where in the process the cross-cutting came. Like, was that something you were thinking of when you were shooting the movie? Or was that something in the editorial, you know, bay that they came up with? I think it was probably more editorial. Um, I, I, you know, I, we knew that I try, Mark and I have done this for years and with Matt also, um, plan sequences in a way that we know generally what scene's going to cut with what scene. And we try to do transitional elements and frames that work so you can seamlessly make a frame action move through. So I'm sure that part of our drill was when we're shooting some of these different action sequences, keep action going left to right, keep the, you know, the people the same size in the frame, try to keep that kind of continuity in image. So it could be used in a different way. Now, I can't say that we actually knew we were gonna cut uh, specific elements of that, but Matt and the, the other guy, I forget who they brought on to help cut the action stuff, another name. Sorry, he, he was not a regular to us. Um, just, you know, looked at the material and knew how to blend it well to make it work. So it, it, I thought it was pretty seamless the way it all worked. Definitely. I mean, I think like that was something Bond fans took from this movie was that the action was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. So, I mean, definitely home run there. Yeah. Yeah. What's we, we tried for. And, you know, the funny thing is all the comments about, oh, it's a lousy script. And the, the evil guy wasn't so evil because they're used to these over the top, you know, just almost cartoon character evil guys with weird weapons from outer space or for whatever they do, you know, lasers, all that kind of stuff. To me, this one, especially now looking back on it with the real situation of water on Earth. And the, I mean, this guy was more evil than some guy with a with a laser out in space trying to put a hole in, you know. In a, in a spaceship or whatever. Um, I think it's, I think time is going to vindicate the storyline and, and Matthew, I thought Matthew did a fantastic job as a not completely over the top, but crazy bad guy. Oh yeah. He didn't do the Remy Malek stick, which was a bit, you know, took it that much further. Right. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right, as you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? It's the first part of our Christmas extravaganza. We are going to do a commentary for 1996's The Long Kiss Goodnight. Come dice some vegetables with Gina Davis and let's have a merry time. And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards but before this message self-destructs cam resume the spy jinx well i mean just touching on the uh, opera sequence for a second I, I i i credit this film for giving james bond the, his first bit of spy work in quite a few films because mm -hmm. he uh he hadn't seemed to have done any spy work for a while and we, we talk about spy movies every week so it always irritates me when he's not being a spy so that's like yeah. my favorite spy moment in the film 
It's it it definitely was. I, I, I when you say that, I can't remember too much of other recent ones where there really was kind of spy work done. It was more like just you're chasing a bad guy and you're told by M or headquarters, go after this person, follow them, you know, check their passport, do those all kind of tricky things to chase them, but not really. Yeah, you're you're right. That spying and talking to them and saying, you know, run through the earpiece. You're being watched. You're being spied on. Good catch. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what we do here. But um, <laughs> now, so. um, what well, we've spoken about, Cam and I have said our favorite bits. I mean, mine's the, the chase at the beginning and also the, the opera sequence. But what about you? You were there. What were some of your favorite shots that you put together for the film? Um, I love the staircase, the stairwell from the interrogation room and the chase going through the, the, the underground with the water that was all built on stage. Beautiful, beautiful effects. And George Richmond did amazing handheld camera work running around uh, on, the, on that stuff. Um, I loved pretty much everything we did in the hotel at the end mm-hmm. with the, 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 the fight scene and the collapsing bridge and the fire, which was so much real fire, frightening. I mean, how Chris Corbold was able to design these things. And it was all on the bond on the 007 stage. So it was all inside. Nothing was out in the open until the final the final shot, which we built four pieces of the exterior wall outside where they come back out of the room and down the rubble and the flame is on the, in the building behind them after he saved Olga from uh, crazy uh, Ochoa, the, uh, the, the Bolivian general. Um, I made a lot of film, friends on that film, I have to say, because the actors were all really great and went and visited with, the, the, uh, with Ochoa later on in Mexico and watched him do a, a stage play. And, you know, hung out in Mexico City and, um, you know, it's just it, it was a really warm environment, everything about it. So that hotel was extremely warm with all the fire. Uh, I love that. I love the scene in the hotel also where um, Mathieu makes Elvis hold the gun. He says, stay here, hold the gun at the yeah. top. And then we had this rig, a camera rig going through with all the glass breaking, the partitions and everything and the chairs being pulled all in one swooping slow motion shot, which to me was one of the best things that we did visually. I thought it was really striking. And it was all done, you know, it was one take. We had one take at it. And it was all done in camera. And then visual effects, of course, pulled away wires and did all that kind of stuff and added some things. But um, those are two of my favorites. And, you know, and the stuff in the in the, the plane, inside the, the plane while they're going up and, and he gets out of the seat. And we had these rigs, special rigs built that were attached to the plane that showed him in the cockpit and then came around with him in as he got off and then slid down with him, leading him and following him and then going out the door with this rig. I mean, they built a full-sized DC-10 fuselage just without wings that was on a gimbal that went from a ver- even like horizontal like this to 90 degrees. And it could roll, I think, 15 degrees either each way on this massive gimbal on the lake, the dry lake at Pinewood Studios, where we had then a blue screen all around it. I mean, I love that that whole scene in there, you know, and shooting it, getting the elements, being able to do all the, the tricky stuff and using all those amazing film tools that we have at our, you know, remote heads and, and, and all that kind of stuff that just, uh, I, I geek out a little bit on that stuff. I'm just curious how much of a learning curve there was jumping into a production this size with, you know, all these, you know, gadgets and whatever that you're able to use. Did it feel like a pretty comfortable evolution of, you know, your career at that point? Or did it feel like a real like, oh, this is a lot? No, it, it was I mean, it was a lot, but it was it was a definite evolution. And I never felt like I was behind the eight ball on anything because I had also been doing all the time I was doing the movies with Mark and like Kite Runner, which had a lot of stuff going on in it. Um, I also did a lot of commercials. And in commercials, we always get to use all of the newest tools and uh, fancy equipment that you can't always get on your features. But I had used four different types of telescopic cranes. Uh, I had used, I shot from helicopters since me hanging out of the helicopter on a Tyler mount shooting a Volkswagen commercial in New York in the late seventies, if I can say that. Um, 
And then, you know, using Spaceball, all those space cam, all those kind of things I did on, on other movies. Um, steady cam. I was a steady cam operator for seven years. So I was very well versed in that remote head stuff I had been doing again with the, with the cranes. So it was all accumulation and I read a lot and I go to the, the Cinegear and the trade shows and you, it's part of the job is you just have to keep yourself educated and try to do whatever you can to stay up with the technology. And it's getting harder and harder because it changes now every six months, there's, you know, major changes. Um, but it's still, you know, basically storytelling and just finding the right tools to use for it. So, no, I felt comfortable with it. It was just a bigger scale that I've been used to, but I had all the support that we needed. Our schedule was realistic. Uh, I don't ever think that we felt um, challenged in any manner. It wasn't luxurious, but it was realistic. And I only remember one equipment failure at all the entire time, which was a max mover for an 18K light outside of the hotel room at the Panama in Panama for the Haitian hotel where they have the fight and goes out onto the balcony. I was at two Ma- Air- Arimaxes pointing in, giving me daylight coming through, and one of the max movers died. And the camera, we couldn't adjust the light. And the way the Brits work, they can't go up in the in the uh, cherry picker or the crane to adjust the light and stay there. They have to adjust something, then they have to come down and send it back up by itself. It's part of health and safety. Whereas I was used to in the States, an electrician goes up there and they stay up there, freeze at night, whatever it is, they're up there with the light if you need to do adjustments. So we were stuck with one light out of sorts. That was the only thing technologically that I, you know, equipment wise that I can remember that that crapped out on us that compromised a little bit, but not terribly. We love our health and safety in Britain. So yes. that doesn't surprise me at all. We, yes. we no, genuinely they, they, love it. They were with us on the entire location scout, the tech scout, not the location scout, the tech scout and all of the shoot. Barry, I think was his name, was the, the head guy. They were there all the time. Yeah. I mean, it keeps people safe. That's yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Or the hope is at least anyway. Yeah. Um, well, actually spinning off from that a little bit, because as you say, you got all these toys to play with. Was there ever anything when you... I said tools. Mm. They're not toys. Quite right. I'm, very, I'm very strict about that. It's like if you say, well, let's shoot the rehearsal, then it's not a rehearsal, right? <laughs> they're not toys. They are tools. And they're very expensive and very refined tools made specifically for, for, for specific jobs. So I like to be clear on that. You are the director of photography in the room. You tell me what to say. <laughs> the tools you had yeah. all the tools at your behest do what you want with them but so i guess the sky was the limit when it came to that but was there ever something that you envisioned for a scene that they just out of budgetary reasons or anything they just couldn't do no apart from shooting in 65 mil which then they related to they reverted to years later on other shows um i don't recall honestly anything you know if we needed something we had it. We had descender rigs. We had an ascender rig in, in Siena, the shot where we first come into Siena, where the car pulls up and the camera's behind it. And then it goes up. It, the car goes through the, the portal of, uh, v, of Siena and the camera just goes up, 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 up to about, I don't know, 150 feet in the air. You see all of Siena behind it. And, you know, that was Dan Bradley bought that in from, from LA. It was a, a, an ascender rig that he had built and he brought it in. I used something similar on the movie Stay with Garrett Brown, the early Skycam. We used his first version of Skycam at the Brooklyn Bridge. So I kind of knew that kind of tool and what you could do with it. But Dan up the ante. They didn't budget that, you know, brought it in. We did it. It was the way to go. Well, the other thing I, I was going to mention is, and you said early on, you were a Bond fan. One of your first, you remember going to see from Russia with Love as your first Bond film. You are a Bond fan, I would say. Yes. Was there ever a moment where you had to struggle with, because of course they're trying to change Bond as well. It's an evolution, this Daniel Craig era, yeah. as it were. So it's a whole other way of telling a Bond story. Did you ever have any like problems in your head of fighting the two different halves of wanting to have that sort of 60s Bond classical era or going for this more action, you know, fist pump kind of style of Bond? No, because to me, <laughs> what we what we achieved was really much more of the 60s ethos. And Daniel in this was much more of the Sean Connery character, a little less refined. 
but he was more of Sean Connery Bond than the jocular Roger Moore or the Pierce Brosnan who was sort of coming down from the jocular jocularity and the goofy jokes and the, you know, the corny Southern sheriff kind of stuff, um, but was still not quite as, he was still a little more refined than either, I think, Sean or, or, or Daniel were. Um, but we know we needed to add the act more action to it. I mean, that's just the audience has such a short attention span these days. If anything lasts on, ca- on screen, any one shot lasts, you know, now it feels like three seconds, you know, change the channel or change your, you know, whatever you're looking at on your phone go to Instagram and look away and come back. Um, so we knew we had to keep up with the, the generation. Um, mm-hmm. But no, I didn't feel, I didn't feel frustrated by it. I actually felt like we were going back to the roots of Bond a lot more than they had been doing. Casino Royale did a little bit of it, I felt, and especially with that introduction scene, I thought it was really great. Um, but no, I, I was very happy with the, the tack that we were allowed to take and, and the direction it went as far as that went. Um, and try to keep corniness. There were some corny jokes thrown in that were excised, and Daniel was on that too. He said, "I'm not saying that." Right. No, that's 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 not my character. I don't say that. <laughs> that kind of. You talk about like the classic Bond era, and one of the big shots that came out of this movie and became kind of instantly iconic was the um, Olga covered in oil sequence. You know, calling yeah. back to Goldfinger. I would love yeah. to know just about. Hmm? Wasn't it? It was Gemma Arterton. Oh, yes. Sorry, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, apologies. Yeah. Strawberry Fields, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just worked with her sister on another show. Arterton. Gemma, yes. Ah, yeah. But yeah, just I would love to know about shooting that shot, but also how much you were, you know, looking at Goldfinger. Were you looking, you know, to comp- like compare the two shots to make them somewhat equal? I had a still frame mm-hmm. from the original movie, and I said to Dennis and to Mark, I said, we've got to, re- we've got to do the homage. It's, it's, it's so obvious. We've just got to do the exact same shot. The only thing we'll do now that we can, because the sensors aren't there, we can remove the chair that was covering her butt. So now you can see her butt. But otherwise, we had Olga, uh, we, we had uh, Gemma in the same position, the bed, the camera in the same place. The whole thing was placed to do a complete mm-hmm. homage to that shot. Yes, no, it's completely, completely conscientious right. and planned and, uh, and happily achieved was that something like as soon as that was in the script it was like we have to do this um yeah i think as soon as as soon as i read uh where mark and i were reading the scenes because we go through the entire script together and plot out every shot through the whole movie before we even get to the set the first day um we said we were going to do that yeah and we talked to us about that and made sure that we had the right you know bedroom hotel room set up to be able to the lamp and everything in the right position it was important I, 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 it's great. It, it's nice to have a callback, and it's not one of those uh, hit you over the head references, which you do see in some of these other Bond films. Um, I want to ask about a scene that was shot that okay never made the final cut, and that is the yeah. alternate ending with Mister White. Um, I mean, it, this has been written about already. This isn't uh, again new information, but as someone who you know you've crafted the story you you visually put it up on the screen was it strange to have this that whole thing pulled from the film despite having shot it all yeah um at the time i, I mean i didn't really understand why i thought maybe the, the film's running too long and they don't really need it um i think maybe they didn't want mr white to die actually in the end they wanted to be able to carry him on to or let the audience think that he could show up again if he doesn't. Um, it was a fun scene that we shot in this great old grand old manor outside of London. And it looked beautiful. It came out great. I have a lot of stills from it. Um, and I've actually used them as a reference for some other things that I've shot since then. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, I don't think I've ever shot any movie where every scene or my favorite shots are in the final edit. In fact, it's a classic thing among us directors of photography, our, our, um, our battle with the editors and the director together with the editor in the editing room is we do these this elaborate crane and, and moving steady cam long shots that go through a whole tracking thing. And then when you get to the final 
two seconds of it are up there and then cut to the close up and the, the rest of it because we just got to keep it moving. We got to keep it moving faster. And, you know, those things, it just, it's just going to happen. You know, it's a collaborative art. None of us, unless you're um, mm. um, Michael Snow, filmmaker, experiment maker, art filmmaker, unless you're Michael Snow mm-hmm. or you're uh, uh, the guy who did La Jete, Chris Marker, if you're someone like that who's doing the entire thing themselves, other voices are going to, and sometimes, I mean, oftentimes, hopefully, rationalize and go, you know, you're too much into your own thing here. You're you're just, you know, you're wallowing in your own stuff. Let's clean it up a little, make it better, and it'll tell a story better. And it'll be better in the end. And you go, yeah, you know, sometimes, sometimes, most of the time they're right. Sometimes you go, well, yeah, they could have just given me a little bit more of that shot. But, you know, it's, um, again, and, and growing now through the years that I've been shooting since uh, my first feature was in 1982 in Rome, Super 16, shooting now uh, back on digital again, film and back into digital um, and seeing what the other departments and other people do to what we shoot because of the touch that they have, even in the avid, they'll reframe without consulting sometimes out even consulting the director the director comes in to look at dailies or a, a scene and they've already reframed the shot because the editor decides they don't like the way it's framed or whatever they want to make a close-up uh, they do sometimes they do coloring in the avid that then the director gets lulled into believing that's what it should be and then you get into the di suite and it's a, a discussion of like why does it look like that well it should look like those kind of things vfx have a great hand cgi and the colorist, if you have a good colorist, I mean, they are a partner. So I'm a great believer that we are, we don't own the image. We don't, you know, we're not the gatekeeper of the image like we were when it was shooting film and nobody knew what was going to really come out in the dailies the next day. Sometimes we didn't even know. It was one of the, 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 the greatest um, comments I ever heard. Um, and I'm going to space out on a name again. Um, one of the greatest American cinematographers at the ASC Awards got the Lifetime Achievement Award. And he said, one of the beauties of shooting on film is that you don't really know 100% what's going to come out in from the lab. There's different chemicals every day. There's the heat, there's the this, there's the that, something in the exposure, something. But the beauty is the magic when things come out better than you thought they would. And you get that, oh my God, that's really amazing. That's something that's kind of lost now. When you're shooting, everybody on set sees it on the monitors. Yeah, you can change things later, but it's, but then it's, it's, you know, it's a conscientious decision. It's not the magic that we used to have. But you're speaking about, you know, elements of your profession that you just don't get as much anymore. One of the things I absolutely love about this movie is how bustling it is with people. I watch so many blockbusters nowadays where, you know, they're defending a city and there's like one person in the background as an extra. And with Quantum, there are people all over this movie in the background. I think it makes it feel so much more alive. I would love to just hear from you. Was that something very difficult to deal with when you're shooting? Because it's a lot more elements kind of going on in the background. We had, we had, well, we had Michael Lerman, who's our first AD, is a brilliant first AD. And we've worked on him, worked with him since Monsters Ball. Um, he, the only one he didn't do was uh, Machine Gun Preacher, I think, because we had to get a South African. Um, and he wasn't available for that one. But he has a team that deals with, with background, with extras that are just extraordinary. Um, they were used to it. The, the British, Toby Hefferman, I think, was his second AD, who's now like a master first AD. And the, the crowd control people were spectacular working with extras. But I think part of what you're saying that you're seeing now, if you're thinking about anything that was shot in the last three years, is COVID. The pandemic restricted what we could have. You can now, you wanted the script call for 250 extras in a theater, you could have 20. It just, they weren't allowed to do it. And I, I ran into that on some, some scenes that I was shooting in London 
in uh, during during the pandemic, uh, even last year, earlier last year, we couldn't have more than twenty extras in a room. If you're in a room, you couldn't have more than twenty people. You know, it it really really was affecting it. So it may be part of that perception is that more of the blockbusters the thing you've been seeing recently, because if they're a real blockbuster, they've got the money for the extras. It's the medium budget and the smaller budget that can't afford all the extras, unless you go to, if you're in South Africa, if you're in, uh, you know, a th- quote unquote third world country or someplace where unfortunately they get paid almost nothing. I mean, when I first moved to Italy, and I was before I shot my first feature, I was working as an extra. And they gave you, I think, basically the equivalent of $30 a day plus a box meal. You know, you can't do that these days. Even the equivalent of $30, because then $30 is probably like $75 now. Yeah. The PAs on a, on a TV show, on a movie get $150 a day, I think. Now, it's just... You know, it's just economics. So, the, but the real big movies should have. A lot of times they say, "Well, we'll do it in VFX. We'll replicate crowds." And sometimes it works, and sometimes it's really obvious. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this earlier. Um, you said about the sort of the the fans chose Casino Royale out yeah. of the two. In, in in sort of looking in more hindsight, in retrospect, about the film now. Um, and I'll I'll maybe get more to legacy in my follow up question, but when this film came out, and it's clear, Cam and I are both fans of the film. In our review this week, we spoke very highly of it, and we love what it was doing and what you did with it. And clearly, you're very passionate about the film that you put out. What was your takeaway from sort of the response from fans and, and critics when it came out? Uh, I can't say it was suicidal, suicidal, but it was depressing. Mm-hmm. It was like, what the. What are they? What are they not seeing? What are they not getting? Mm-hmm. Um, I really didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. It was like somebody had put out something on the internet saying, "Don't like this film, no matter what, even if you do like it, and tell everybody you don't like it." It was very weird because I think it really stands up. I think it holds up. I mean, I was complimented many times by other DPs on it, saying they thought it was a brilliantly shot, one of the best shot Bond films they had ever seen. Um, even today, they. You know, I've gotten those compliments and it's not, you know, to, to make me feel good about it. But I think as a film, I really think it it stands up. And I think it, as I said, I think it'll be vindicated with the um, attention to the water issue around the world. But I think it's also just look at it again and appreciate it as a Bond action film. It's got everything there. You know, maybe it doesn't have a goofy bad guy. You know, maybe that's a good thing. Although Elvis was kind of goofy. He was played goofy. Yeah, it, for sure. I yeah. mean, he had about as much hair on the front of his head as I do mine. So I, I, I probably need, <laughs> I probably need the same wig as well. So, um, oh, poor Elvis. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't remember where I came down it when it when it came out. But it's it's interesting now. It's it's going through that process of being reappraised, especially by sort of the Bond fans. Okay. There's been a lot of like video essays. There's a really great one. Uh, on YouTube at the moment that I'll point out by Film Speak, which is quite a popular channel, and basically just says misunderstood mm. Quantum of Solace, mm. and I completely agree with that sentiment. I think a lot of people went to theaters maybe expecting something else and didn't necessarily get that, but often you'll tend to find people who don't know what they want, right? And that's I think that's probably where it missed the mark in that sense because people would just had these wrong expectations. But I'm well, glad it's getting that reappraisal. Sorry, go on. No, I, I was gonna say I think they also heard the press beforehand saying script problems, big script problems. We they went into it without a script. There was a strike. Uh the the the, the script writers walked off the you know at midnight of the strike and never had it again. They went in with half a script, and people take that and they start building it in their mind, they're watching the film and going. Oh yeah, there's no script. There's even if they don't know, even if they don't understand, whatever. I think it's you know it's it's the power of suggestion. Mm-hmm. I think really. Well, it's like that group think thing, isn't it? As well, yeah. everyone just sort of starts to yeah. say the same thing. Yeah. I don't know what they what they went in expecting and didn't get. I mean, there was more action and better action than Casino Royale. Um, yes, the parkour sequence was great. I have to admit that was great. The rest of the action was you know typical fight stuff and as I said, a bad car rollover. Um, I don't know. It's 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 it was a mystery to me. 
And I'm hoping that it gets a resurgence. It would be nice. It, it's definitely now that Daniel Craig's era in air quotes has finished. Yeah. Um, and we all know how that finished. Um, it's definitely being looked at as one of the better entries in his his five film journey. And I, I'm I for one, I'm glad. But like, I just wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on it being reappraised? Are you happy that it's getting that treatment? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't aware of it because I'm not following stuff on the internet about it, but I'm happy to hear that. Um, I think it's up there easily with Skyfall and Casino Royale. Um, I don't think the other two were very good. Was it Spectre and um, what was the one? There was Spectre. No Time to Die. No Time to Die was not bad. No Time to Die was actually pretty good. I felt No Time to Die stole a lot of their uh, action tropes from ours and the other films, like the whole thing over the rooftops with the motorcycle, all that stuff. I mean, we did that in Siena. We did that in Panama. It's, yes, there's so many, so many times you can reinvent the wheel. Um, there were some great pieces in there and there were some sticky pieces, uh, but it was definitely better than Spectre. I thought Spectre was kind of a, a, a dog um, on many levels. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think this was anything less than Skyfall. I think Skyfall maybe had some more um, bigger, fancier um, set pieces, like the the, sure. the Al Casino and the boat ride going up to it, the Shanghai building where it's just all the, the you know the 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 screens outside the windows that they did on stage, which were it was it was impressive stuff. It was good set pieces. Um, but I mean, I, I think ours is right up there with it. And I I, I, I honestly think ours, the Quantum of Solace, is a more interesting, better film than Casino Royale. I, th I think it upped the ante from Casino. And I thought it brought Daniel's character that much more. I think people really love the thing about Casino is that Vesper died and that he lost. You know, um, and that that was a, a heartfelt moment that they didn't feel they got in ours because... He was mourning her, but there was no, you know, didn't get her back. Yeah, I think there was that sort of like sweeping romanticism of Casino Royale that people really fell in love with. And probably were almost looking at your movie yeah. as, well, here's Casino Royale part two. And it wasn't, right? Right. No, it was a new movie. It was a different movie. It was, it was continuing the Mr. White thread, but that was about it. Taking us to a whole nother continent, a whole nother... Mm -hmm evil plan right well there you go roberto you've you've chronicled the story of quantum of solace with us thank you for sharing your insights but we can't let you go without asking you the question that everyone who has been on this show has been asked from john glenn to mariam darbo to you what is your favorite spy movie do i have to bring it down to one it, you would not be the first person to mention a few. I think even John Glenn got a couple in. So by all means, if you have a couple. When anybody asks me, what's my favorite movie? I say, I don't have a favorite movie. I probably have 10. Mm -hmm. And it depends, it depends on the month or the year, what I'm feeling like. Um, so I usually list a bunch of them. What's my favorite song? My famous favorite musician? I, you know, I don't have one. So I have a list of seven. Seven. Okay. I like this. And I will, I will read them. And this is not necessarily in um, order mm -hmm. of uh, the most, the best, the most important. They're all kind of, but I think the one that probably affected me the most. And if I had to say one was the most, the third man. Mm. Yes. I like this. Every, every level. It's, um, it's just beyond what all the other spy movies are. It's totally character, visual, storytelling. Um, it takes you into a whole other universe that's under, that, that's a relatable to, but still is out there. And it's just got some amazing performances. And it's just a wild, wild, wild story. And it's a, it's a classic. So The Third Man is probably up, up at the top of the pyramid. And then in no particular order, there's the Ipcris file and funeral in Berlin, which are the Harry Palmer. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yep. Also in movie theaters as a uh, adolescent. And so, you know, big impression. 
Then three doc, you know, three bonds the, from Rushwood Love, Dr. No, and Goldfinger, partly also because of the time of my life when I saw them. And but they were all to me, those are the ultimate kind of bond spy movie things. And then I noticed there was no love for billion dollar brain. Eh, no, it's not my favorite. <laughs> it's um, it, I don't know. it's kind of like like the Bourne movies. I like the first one, the Doug Lyon mm -hmm. one. I got really didn't really like the other ones. They got too much about shaky cam and just, you know, like I couldn't watch them. Um, but then the latest one is one I just saw and it had somebody recommend that I see it for other reasons. But it's a brilliant movie on every level again. A uh, recent film, Polish film, directed by Agnieszka Holland, called Mr. Jones. Mm. It's a World War World War II Polish spy film, and it's it's really amazing, amazing to look at, and it's it's a great story, and it's really spyware. Okay, I have to add that to our list to cover. Hmm. So we have a, a, a running list of spy films that we're going to... We, the, the goal is to tackle every single one of them eventually. Uh, and this one, you've you've actually given us one that isn't on there. That That is a first for one of our guests on the show. Uh, we haven't had the third man many times. I appreciate having that mentioned. Good luck finding somebody from the third man. Oh, yeah. that yeah. I, I mean, we do films back to like the 1930s and 20s, so it's, okay. it's not always interviews, unfortunately. But... Right. Um, we can't. We do what we can, but yeah, I, we'll definitely be adding that one to our list. If it's if it's got your stamp of approval, there's got to be something there. No, it's amazing. Yeah, and it's last couple of years. Did you say, uh, Mr. Jones? I think was yeah within the last two years. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's Cam's homework to add it to the list. I think I, I was able to see it on Amazon Prime or one of those streamers. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Looked at it a couple of months ago. That's what we like to hear. Makes it a lot easier in some of these 1930s films that you just can't find anymore. Um, but excellent answers. Uh, your spy credentials are approved. Your your papers are... are we're good, happy for your papers. You can go through the border now. It's all good. Um, Roberto, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us about Quantum of Solace. Um, and you know, what is it you're working on at the moment? Have you got anything coming out soon you can tell us about or something you're passionate you're working on? I'll only say the last thing I did that's coming out, I think it's coming out in the spring, maybe sooner. No, probably not until the spring. I've just been doing the color timing on. It's a TV series for Amazon uh, produced by Kilter Films, Jonah Nolan. Uh, it's called The Peripheral from the William Gibson novel, who's a Vancouver resident. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's Oh, that sounds awesome. Cool. And that's it's looking like it's coming out in the spring. Yeah, I think so, because I know they're still working on cutting uh, two of the episodes and I just did the, the final color timing on the episodes, but I, I know they're still doing some cutting and rearranging and stuff. So, I mean, maybe it'll come out in the fall. It's on, it would be on Amazon. So there is a teaser out for it. Okay. So you might, you might look that up. It's with um, Chloe Moretz. Right. Well, we'll put a link to that in the show notes below. So everyone can go check that out if we can find it as well. But yeah, Roberto, honestly, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. And um, as we said, I'm glad the film is getting more love now because it deserves it. Me too. Thank you. And it makes me feel I'll have a much better evening tonight knowing that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, there you go, folks. That was our chat with cinematographer extraordinaire, Mr. Roberto Schaefer. And it's important to mention before we go on, he did want us to talk about a certain cinematographer, Cam. So earlier in the interview, uh, Roberto had quoted from a famous cinematographer. And he would like us to, to mention that that was Caleb Deschanel, one of the most acclaimed cinematographers um, around. He's a six-time Oscar nominee, worked on movies like Being There, The Right Stuff, The Natural. Most recently, he did the visual design for John Favreau's The Lion King. So we just wanted to get that out there. It's Caleb Deschanel and uh, one of the greats. Absolutely. But uh, Cam, let's talk about the interview. It's difficult for, you know, an audio podcast to try and break down a film visually with a cinematographer. Obviously, we had the same thing with Dan Mandel for Spy Game. Um, but I think we had a really insightful chat. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting because I think, you know, you mentioned it in the, uh, you know, right up front that like Quantum, especially at the time it was released, was quite controversial with Bond fans for um, primarily the editing, but often editing and just the visual style gets 
intermingled in people's minds when they talk about the movie. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting. Maybe the most interesting kind of bit of gold in this interview for me was hearing him talk about the intention of this movie, Quantum of Solace, and that they wanted to really create another Dr. No or Goldfinger. They were looking very much at the classic Bond movies of the past as opposed to, say, you know, really going in saying, we want to make James Bond into Jason Bourne. And he himself even expressed not a lot of interest in sort of that Bourne shaky cam style. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think a lot of what uh, we get in the end of Quantum is, is to do with the editing more than how it was shot. Because, And even we suggested when we spoke to David Zeritsky about the film, you know, it, it's a very visually stunning film. They, they, they really do capture some interesting visuals that you've not seen before in a Bond film. And I think they really do try and push the envelope when it comes to action as well. It's just sort of perhaps let down by the editing. But, you know, it's interesting that he wanted to go back to sort of the classics because this film had its troubled upbringing, obviously the production issues. So they really wanted to give it as much as they could. So one thing they could influence, it wasn't the script, but it was the visuals. They really wanted to give it as much as they could. Yeah, and I mean, Roberto had worked with Mark Forster on a number of movies, you know, Finding Neverland, Monsters Ball, Stay, Stranger Than Fiction... So, like, even if the situation involving the script and all that sort of stuff, the writer strike stuff with Quantum of Solace, is kind of tumultuous, you have a very comfortable working relationship between the director and the cinematographer. So at least that was very concrete. And you really get the sense that, like, regardless of whatever script issues they were dealing with day to day, um, the visual style of this movie is very accomplished. And that's something that when I was doing the research uh, for the interview... I really made a pass of the mo at the movie, just where I sat down and just focused on every visual element I could with my notes. And that was where it really clicked with me. Because, I mean, I'd heard Mark Forster talk in the past about the, you know, the four elements. But to really pay attention and see how Roberto had worked those into the visual design of the movie and also the hiding in plain sight aspect of the water, mm -hmm. I thought was really, really clever. And... The sort of thing you would love to see in more Bond movies, quite honestly. Well, a lot of, I imagine a lot of directors that tackle Bond films think they have to really stick to a certain visual style that's been set over the last X amount of films at the time they do it. But I guess they were given sort of carte blanche to do what they felt was best with this film, which is interesting as well because Casino Royale was such a success. You'd think stepping away from that sort of formula would be a bad idea, but they. Seem to they were given free reign basically within the sort of what should be a Bond film to make the film they wanted, and I think the the visuals in this film are a success. Totally, and I think that's one thing that has kept Bond going for sixty plus years is that it isn't scared to reinvent itself or find ways to step outside the box stylistically, um, storytelling wise. That's why this franchise has endured, and the fact is, like maybe in two thousand eight people walked out of Quantum feeling a little disappointed or not digging what it had it set out to achieve. Mm. But it's also a movie that's very much in the midst of a massive reappraisal. So I think like Roberto's work is probably going to be more appreciated now than it would have been in 2008. Absolutely. And one thing, I mean, you mentioned Bourne and not being particularly interested in trying to do that. One thing Roberto sort of highlighted in the interview was the, the chase with Mitchell. Uh, just after Mr. White gets away and sort of crashing through the ceiling. A lot of that's sort of done digitally and sort of composited together. But he referenced the chase in Tangier from Bourne Ultimatum and seeing Jason Bourne run and jump into that window. He, he felt the film kind of let itself down, Bourne Ultimatum, I should say, because it didn't follow Jason Bourne through the window and see him mm, jump yeah. into action on the other side. It sort of cut there. And that's what he wanted to achieve with that scene of Bond and Mitchell falling through the glass into the scaffolding to the floor. And I, I'd never seen it from that perspective before. Uh, I'd never made that comparison. So it was really interesting to hear Roberto talk about that. Yeah, it's always fun when you have one-upsmanship going on in filmmaking. And you often see it with like horror directors where they'll acknowledge a previous horror director's work and then go a step further within the same movie. Um, and I like that, yeah, he's acknowledging a moment that is pretty iconic mm -hmm. in Born Ultimatum. One I think people really remember and saying we can do better. 
and we can deliver something even cooler. Yeah, and um, your opinion on whether they do or do not do that is entirely down to you, the listeners and viewers of the film. But I appreciate that they acknowledged what was going on in spy and action movies at the time and thought, let's try and up the ante here, which is really, historically, what Bond has always done. Let's try and push the envelope. And that's what a director and a cinematographer should be doing when they come into a franchise like this. How can we go one step further, not how can we make just another one of these films? Yeah, and I think that's one of the interesting things about the whole Craig era is that you really have four very distinct stamps on those films. I mean, you have uh, Sam Mendes doing you know, the third and fourth, even though you can look at the change in cinematographers and that both Spectre and Skyfall look very different from one another. Um, but, you know, in terms of just like director, um, cinematographer collaborations, there's a lot going on throughout that franchise. And there's like kind of like a flavor for anyone. Yeah. And of course, there was that tragic accident where the 35 millimeter film for Spectre was, you know, drenched in yellow paint. And then we ended up with what we ended up. <laughs> Hold on to that one, Scott. We got a ways to go before Spectre yeah, arrives. We do. We do. We do. But yeah, there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Roberto and hearing his perspective on what they were trying to achieve with the visuals of Quantum of Solace. Uh, uh, Cam said, you know, that the film's going through sort of a, a reappraisal at the moment, and I hope these interviews, this with the Rufus Wright one, have given you some different perspectives on what they were trying to do, and hopefully sort of enriched your viewing experience when you next go around to sticking on the Quantum of Solace. Uh, but the James Bond magic does not end here. That train has not quite pulled into the station. I think we have one more mission for our listeners. That's right. The quantum thread does continue on, but we're opening it up to the bigger world of James Bond by talking to the director of the Sound of 007 documentary, Matt Whitecross. Yeah, it's, um. I mean, we'll detail it more in the interview but i was there at the bfi when they premiered the film a couple of months ago now time of recording and i just made sure i got i got in contact with matt and we set this up because me and cam both care a lot about the music when it comes to just films in general but also james bond and i think the sound of 007 is a wonderful documentary so speaking to the man that helped put it all together i i you know it's a wonderful interview, and I, I know you'll all enjoy it and get a lot from it. So I guess your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out the Sound of 007 documentary. It's on Amazon Prime right now, so if you've got Prime, just give it a watch. And then, of course, join us this Friday for our chat with the director, Mr. Matt Whitecross. It's a wonderful chat, and you'll get a lot from it. It will take you to an all-time high and speaking of all-time highs if you uh, fancy it please leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts and do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spy hards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next time listeners remember everything cam touches withers and dies hey